The 6.5 is on the road in Barcelona, Spain for Mobile World Congress 2024. We are here in the IBM booth and Dan, we can just sit, I'm gonna call it here. Mobile World Congress is back. There are tons of people in the hallways chatting, doing business deals, pontificating, talking about the future, talking about value add today. Yeah, Pat, this show has always been one of the most instrumental. Anytime that you sort of think about the importance that the network plays in your life, you just pull out this device, whatever device you're on, and you think about, would I be able to do whatever I'm doing right now if I didn't have the network? And yeah, sure, maybe sometimes you're on the Wi-Fi's, but that's a network too, by the way. But that carrier network, what the service providers do to enable what we're doing with generative AI, AI, machine learning, running our applications, social media with our friends, and of course, all this cool new stuff we're seeing with augmented and virtual reality, Pat, this is powerful stuff. And sometimes I think we take it for granted a little bit, but yeah, I mean, 95,000 people here, 95,000. This show is almost back to the full capacity, and boy, have I seen a lot of great stuff. By the way, it only took us uh, a minute and a half to get to the word AI, and that is permeating uh, not only I the consumer play, but also, also B2B, and it's an enabler. It's an enabler of business, it's an enabler of, of value. By the way, it's really hard, and we still haven't uh, cracked it uh, yet, but we do have two guests that are working very hard to figure all of this out. Uh, Andrew, IBM, nice to see you again. CBA. Usually we say first time guest, but second time guest and two years in a row. Uh, and of course, Mark from Bell Canada, great to see you. Great to see you as well. Absolutely. All right, so gentlemen, you heard my preamble. I talked a little bit about kind of what's going on in the state of the network. I had a great couple of meetings and we were actually talking about how sometimes it's so easy to forget lose the appreciation for all that these companies here, these service providers do to enable us every day on every one of our devices to be able to do all of the important things that we do, whether it's work or play, connecting with our family and our friends. But let's talk about wireless networks a little bit. Um, Andrew, I'm going to start this one off with you, but I would like you to talk a little bit about what you see, kind of the state of wireless networks today. And in particular with AI, what's the problem that we're coming together here to solve? I mean, that's to your point, right? The deployment of 5G networks, the deployment and expectations that we have of, of mobile networks today are absolutely huge. And so the, the promise of AI, and we'll talk about whether we're going to get there or not and how quickly, um, is really that it massively can help reduce the operational cost of the network, which is kind of the, the headlines that the Wall Street Journal gets, right? But more importantly, it's going to massively speed up how quickly it, it takes to kind of run process, how easy it is to solve customer challenges, customer problems, um, how, how much effort goes into turning on a new subscriber or solving a problem within the network. So the time compression that's going to happen will greatly increase the efficiency, which leads to the cost dynamic, right? Mark, any, uh, wh what's the perspective from where you sit? Yeah, maybe I can give a bit of context um, what's going on in Canada. So in wireless networks, the competitive landscape has, I would say, changed dramatically in uh, recent times in, in Canada. So I'll just give you an example in the past, uh, 12 months, 2023, the um, average price that a consumer pays for, for data from mobile broadband has reduced by reduced by 27% just, just in one year. Um, and that's against a backdrop of uh, consumer price inflation of plus 4%. So, you know, we're in a real business problem here. Um, the costs of the network, of course, uh, are going in the other direction. The costs of the network are, in fact, uh, increasing. Uh, so we have to solve this business contextual problem. Uh, and that's where Gen AI and AI uh, will play a role going forward. So things like, uh, how do we more intelligently uh, decide on where to invest uh, in the network because of that uh, business challenge? How do we build and operate the networks more cost effectively? Uh, and arguably most important, how do we use generative AI and AI to, to get a better customer experience across our networks? So, generative AI is, is relatively new. Machine learning algorithms go back to the 60s. And we really saw, actually, the, it flourished, started uh, University of Toronto uh, using uh, GPUs to accelerate uh, visual uh, object recognition algorithms. But where are we, what's the maturity level now? I think I might know the answer to this, yeah. uh, but also I want to caveat that machine learning is nothing new to the network. Right. It, it's very much alive and well. Where, where are we on the map right now? 
As it pertains to generative AI on wireless networks, I'd say it's totally nascent. I think we're in the very, very uh, early stages. Is it in the research phase, beyond the research phase? I would say it's in the, uh, in the experimentation phase. So okay. there is a, um, I would say there is a very high cadence of the uh, technology availability uh, becoming available. So therefore, uh, there's a great interest in how do we utilize this to solve problems that we have. So the speed of adoption seems to be uh, fast, um, but to be honest, the business value outcomes as a result of the experimentation are uh, not, not proven out fully. So, so maybe I can help a little bit. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, AI, and some people are calling it classic AI or traditional AI, but um, you know, only in, even though it's been existing for a long time, only in recent years has it become very valuable in wireless networks. Um, so one of the examples I can give is for uh, customer experience. We've been using um, predictive analytics to really get down to a single customer of one on what their experience is like on the network. Anomaly detection for uh, customer degradations. Uh, so that's positive. And, and some of the experimentation with Gen AI is how do you build upon that? Uh, so how do you uh, use Gen AI models to be able to look for root cause analysis? How do you do it for um, you know, resolution? How do you look for categorization of the customer issues? So the, uh, the interest is high on what it could do, but the realization is, is very early. Right, and I think there's a question really about the readiness of telcos and whether they've got the right data. And if, if they have the right data, do they actually have the ability to orchestrate the network and actually take action? So it's really simple. I mean, if you imagine a query that would come in like, why was Andrew's social media experience terrible yesterday? Right, he couldn't post, you know, do we have the right data to be able to answer that, that natural language query? And then further think about a query like, um, or a command, increase the capacity to FC Barcelona's football stadium and all of the surrounding um, public transport systems by another 30,000 spectators. Could the network actually do that? Or would it take six weeks to go to provision it? So the danger with AI in, in that context is that if we apply it too soon, it's going to be fairly toothless because it's just going to be able to answer, you know, why was my bill $20 more expensive this, this month, right? That's a perfect use case for where we are today. But these more kind of deep use cases are where we have to get to to get to the savings and get to the customer value. Yeah, that's a, a problem that could be handled by generative in many ways. Why is my social media performing so poorly? It's uh, A, the network is bad, or B, it was your post was bad, and generative AI decided not to allow you to actually put that online. Maybe we'll get there at some point. I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just having a little fun with you. Mark, you know, he made a comment about right data. You know, so, so Bell Canada, for instance, you know, in order to do this, it is about having the right data. It's having the right data, and of course there's you know, a lot of ethics, there's governance, something IBM is, by the way, very, very focused on, and it did, you know, with Watson the governance very early on, but, you know, how are you thinking about that part of the right data, making sure that people are getting a great experience, but it's at the same time, and trusting that they still are having levels of privacy, that their data is not being abused for things like advertising, I mean, it's a, it's a balance. Where are you for, at for with sure. that? Yeah, first of all, we, we, you know, we have a lot of data, and I think your point is right, do we have the right data? And I think it's a, a problem about data organization, the organization of the data across the various areas that it, that it lies in the network. Um, a, a big part of it is about the, the reliability uh, of the data, it's about the location of the data, it's about the availability of the data, it's about the, the right access to the data with the right controls that you referenced based on the user that wants to access it. Is that the right data they should be able to access? So in Bell, we found this. Uh, we find, feel this is a foundation to the success of, of Gen AI is having that data organization. So we have a, a program we call DAS Data as a Service, where we're using a mesh architecture across our various data sources with all of the right connectors that will plug into those, in, into those various uh, sources using the power of, um, of public cloud to be able to help uh, accelerate some of that adoption. Um, and with that foundation, we think we'll be able to get some of those uh, governance, uh, security, privacy, uh, and quality data integrity elements uh, correctly organized. You know, my first uh, computer class that I had in high school, they taught me garbage in, garbage out, which very much is what we're talking about. And out of one side of my mouth, I'm going to say, what's old is new, okay? We've been here, done that. But as I, I don't know, take a more mature view, generative AI is different, because one of the elements that it is different it's, it enables co-mingling of different types of data. Uh, ERP, CRM, 
uh, product line management, HRM, and all these, that's the possibility. Machine learning was really narrowed in on a certain subset of, of type of data, and typically it didn't go, get out of its, its swim lane. So having a, a, a data management strategy up front is an absolute requirement, particularly if you're going to be co-mingling these data sets. And, and when uh, we talk to different types of businesses, uh, it, it's that that is where the big, say, home runs in American context are, 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 are going to be. And it's a super exciting moment. I'm actually getting to a question here. So, uh, the two of you have some incredible uh, history. I mean, hundreds of years uh, of doing this. And obviously, I've got you know two network experts up here, and you know practitioner and and, and vendor who helps you do these things. Um, what areas are you looking at using generative AI outside of of the network, potentially you know, commingling the, these types of data? That's a great question, and uh, yeah, Bell will be 134 years old in April of this year, so uh, you know, we've gone through multiple transformations over, over our history, and certainly Gen AI is, is one of those that we feel will really help our digital transformation uh, in, in the coming years and across the organization more broadly. Uh, a lot of experimentation as well on, on those value-adding use cases. A couple of simple examples. Uh, knowledge management is, is, is a great one. So um, stuff like uh, Code Assistant. Uh, so we have a lot of software developers that um, uh, you know there, there is a peer review process on code before we uh, push it in production. Uh, so the ability to be able to use generative AI to take out some of that uh, monotony of uh, code reviews uh, versus the creativity of the code uh, is quite interesting. We're doing some experimentation um, ar around that. There's other stuff like um, documentation. Um, be it for our in, in the network for our for our vendors, very complex documentation, right. how to navigate through uh, that in a very simple way to be able to get you know proposals and answers very quickly, but also on things like employee services across the corporation. Yes. You know uh, my benefits, my company policies, uh, so making that very consumable and, and, and easy to digest. On the business side, lots of opportunity to use uh, the, these huge amounts of data for uh, innovation and products and services. Uh, for our various uh, um, networks. So, you know, there's a, an opportunity really to uh, be creative, to right. look at network trends, to be able to predict what those trends mean, and have very customizable offers and, uh, and products and services uh, uh, for our customers. And then ultimately, customer experience, end to end, is going to be uh, a critical use case that's very, very personalized, right. that's proactive, uh, that's self-serve, fully digital, uh, using all those uh, techniques like, uh, like chatbots and uh, um, other, other methods, so yeah, we, we got excited about what the, the future holds. Yeah, the, the three to four areas that you hit are absolute gold mine opportunities and you won't be the only one doing them, which I think is good, because quite frankly, when it comes to a carrier, you, you have very uh, little room for error uh, in, in, in what you do. IBM has been very aggressive on, you've targeted three, three areas that you're serving your clients, but you're using it yourself, what are some of the areas inside? I mean, Arvind's been very communicative on what you're doing inside the company. Well, right, I think it's called eating your own dog food. Or, uh, I'm not sure I like that term. Um, <laughs> we don't, no, we, we've still never found a better one. Drinking your own right. champagne. <laughs> drinking your own champagne, okay. I, I like it. Let's, let's use that. There you go. No, it's, that's obviously right. I, I think, um, you know, to the, the data part of that, that conversation, um, when we released um, What's Next Start Data, so much of that was about how we consolidate different data sources from different places, you know, completely disparate. With different security levels, With by different the security way. levels, different, and different, some of it public, some of it, you know, within your own system. So, you know, we applied that um, internally to our HR systems um, with our HR chatbot that could, you know, it wasn't toothless, it could answer pretty much any question about you know, how any of our employees, you know, what our policies are, uh, how much they were going to get paid, when their holidays were, all those kinds of things are you know, pretty powerful things. But the power of association um, kind of opens up a whole load of new use cases, things that people aren't necessarily thinking about. So for example, if you're a, a quick serve restaurant, uh, how, how near are all the distribution centers for, for drinks or for food or for suppliers? Those aren't things that you would have necessarily, you wouldn't have them in your own database and own structure. You might have your, obviously you know where your restaurants are. So being able to correlate those kinds of data sets becomes really interesting just by simple query. 
um, the, the union of all SQL requests, if you like, are going to come together to, and obviously it's not SQL these days, but you, you get the point, it's, it's that union which I think is really valuable um, that will uh, it enable that um, kind of types of queries that people aren't even thinking about that they go, oh, I wonder if I could find that out. And I think that's what's really fascinating about their own data sets and their, and their own systems. Um, the other thing we did with our platform, of course, uh, was we enabled our, our, our customers to use any of the available um, language model LLMs that they wanted to uh, on the same data set. So, you know, pick your own journey as to what you get the best results for, right? Uh, and I, I think that's been really valuable in just ter in terms of the open ecosystem that we're creating for that. Um, but it goes back to, you know, you talked about the age of IBM, and I think once you get over 100, you, st you stop talking about how old you are, perhaps, I don't know. Um, but since the founding of, of IBM, it's always been about accelerating business, you know, from the first adding machines to the mainframes to the, so it, this is just that, in, in simpler stuff, that, that, that next, you know, acceleration of business, the next level of efficiency, next level of automation that, that we're getting to. And, and, and that's why it's so exciting, is, is that, that time of revolution that we've had, you know, maybe only three or four times through the history of the company. Great. Well, Mark and Andrew, clearly the network is transformative, and of course we are in the next wave of growth with AI that is going to change every single industry. And I'll finish where I started, that without connectivity, without a strong network, and of course without strong wireless, a lot of what we're doing even right here, right now, the information, the real time, the connectivity, the fact that businesses keep running while all of us are here, is enabled by the power of the network, and only getting more exciting and powerful with generative AI. Mark, Andrew, I want to thank you both for joining us here on The Six Five. We look forward to tracking your journey and talking with you again soon. It's been a thank great you. pleasure, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody, hit that subscribe button. Join us for all the coverage of The Six Five here at MWC 2024. We appreciate you joining us. We hope you come back soon. We'll see you all later.